come to the conclusion that much can be learned about music by devoting oneself to the mushroom. For this purpose, I have recently moved to the country. Much of my time is spent pouring over field companions on fungi. These I obtain at half price in second-hand bookshops, which the latter are in some rare cases next door to shops selling dog-eared sheets of music. Such an occurrence being greeted by me as irrefutable evidence that I am on the right track. In the summer, some 3,000 different kinds of mushrooms are thriving in abundance. In right and left, there are festivals of contemporary music. It is to be regretted, however, that the consolidation of the acquisitions of Schoenberg and Stravinsky, currently in vogue, has not produced a single new mushroom. Mycologists are aware that in the present fungus abundance as it is, the dangerous amanitas plays an extraordinarily large part. Should not program chairmen and music lovers in general come to more months display some prudence? The winter for mushrooms, as for music, is a most sorry season. Only in caves and houses where matters of temperature and humidity, and in concert halls where matters of trusteeship and box office are under constant surveillance do the vulgar and accepted forms thrive. American commercialism has brought about a grand deterioration of the Saliota campestris, affecting through exports even the European market. As a demanding gourmet sees but does not purchase the marketed mushroom, so a lively musician reads from time to time the announcement of concerts and stays quietly at home. If energetically Calibia volutribus should fruit in January, it is a rare event. And happening on one while stalking in a forest is almost beyond one's dearest expectations. Just as it is exciting in New York to note that the number of people attending a winter concert requiring the use of one's facilities is on the upswing. It is important to determine the problems confronting the contemporary mushroom. To begin with, I propose that it should be determined which sounds further the growth of which mushrooms. Whether the latter indeed make sounds of their own. Whether the gills of certain mushrooms are employed by appropriately small winged insects for the production of pizzicati. And the tubes of the boletti by minute burrowing ones as wind instruments. Whether the spores, which in size and shape are extraordinarily various and in number countless, do not, upon dropping to the earth, produce gamelan-like sonorities. And finally, whether all this enterprise activity, which I suspect delicately, excuse me,
lest I be found frivolous and lightheaded, and worse, an impurist, for having brought about the marriage of the Agaric with Eutropy. Observe that composers are continually mixing things up with music. Karl Heinz Stockhausen is clearly interested in music and juggling, constructing as he does global structures, which can be of service only when tossed into the air. There's my friend Pierre Boulez, as he revealed in a recent article, is interested in parentheses and italics. This combination of interest to me seems excessive in number. I prefer my own choice of the mushroom. Furthermore, it is avant-garde. I have spent many present hours in the woods conducting performances of my silent piece, transcriptions that is, for an audience of myself since they were much longer than the popular length that I have had published. At one performance, I passed the first movement by attempting the identification of a mushroom which remained successfully unidentified. The second movement was extremely dramatic, beginning with the sound of a buck and a doe leaping up to within 10 feet of my rocky podium. The expressivity of this moment was not only dramatic, but unusually sad from my point of view. For the animals were frightened of me simply because I was a human being. However, they left hesitatingly and fittingly within the structure of the work. The third movement was a return to the theme of the first but with all those profound, so well-known alterations of world feeling associated with the German tradition, with the ABA. In the space that remains, I would like to emphasize that I am not interested in the relationship between sounds and mushrooms any more than I am between those of sounds and other sounds. These would involve an introduction of logic that is not only out of place in the world, but time-consuming. We exist in a situation demanding greater earnestness, as I can testify, since I was hospitalized after having cooked and eaten experimentally some Spathema fotida, commonly known as skunk cabbage. My blood pressure went down to 50, my stomach was pumped, etc. It behooves us, therefore, to see each thing directly as it is, be it the sound of a tin whistle or an elegant Lepiota Procera.